Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Ology's podcast, Training the Modern Workforce Live. Uh, it's a show discussing training and talent development solutions and best practices. Uh, each episode, we'll talk about a different training topic and make sure to keep an eye out for special guests and interviews from top training professionals. Uh, with me, as always, I have Colin Forward, CEO of Ology. For the last decade, Colin has provided major US hospitals and federal agencies with distance learning solutions. I studied mobile technology at the University of Central Florida while earning a degree in computer science and his MBA. And joining Colin this week is Andrea G. Procaccino, a CMT. Ms. Procaccino is a certified award-winning talent, learning, culture, diversity senior executive with over 25 years experience in global corporate learning, emerging learning technologies, employee engagement, talent management and development, leadership development, diversity, inclusion, and equity, employee recognition, appreciation, and developing corporate cultures. Uh, she is currently the Chief Learning Officer and Vice President of Talent Development and Diversity for New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, the number four hospital in the U.S. and the number one hospital in New York. Uh, she joined NYP in 2014 and has oversight for training and development, uh, technology learning solutions, organizational development, recognition and employee events, and diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Uh, Ms. Procaccino leads the Enterprise-Wide Diversity Inclusion Task Force and the Learning Governance Council. Prior to joining NYP, she was the Executive Director for Global Learning and Development Worldwide for Avon Products, headed up learning and development at Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceutical Research and Development Worldwide, and held numerous leader leadership roles in clinical development for Johnson & Johnson, her tenure there extending over 23 years. Uh, she's a well-known and engaging speaker globally and sits on numerous advisory boards for learning and talent management development. She's a graduate of Douglas College uh, of Rutgers University with a BA in biochemistry and holds numerous professional certifications in learning and development and science management. Um, and full disclosure, New York Presbyterian is an Ology customer, but today's conversation will not be about that. Uh, we're actually gonna be talking about training during an emergency and how New York Presbyterian innovated during a time of crisis. Uh, we've got some great questions on deck already, but feel free to ask any questions that may come up in the chat and we'll go, uh, we'll get to as many as we can. All right, Colin, over to you. All right, thanks, Adam, and thanks for joining us, Andrea. Um, very excited to have you on today. Um, you know, not just because uh, Ology's been working with NYP for a long time, but even before we were working together, when I met you down in Orlando at David Metcalf's lab, um, I had seen that you were really trying to push the envelope in uh, in learning wherever you were, whether it was at Avon or J and J, and you know. I, touched on some of the projects there when I was at the metal lab. So very excited to have you on. And um, you know, your team at NYP is also a, a, a credit to your leadership. Um, having worked with Dennis Myers and Mary Baudet, it's, uh, it's really impressive what you all are able to accomplish at NYP. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you, it's my pleasure. My pleasure to be here. So um, I actually learned a little bit about you in that bio. I didn't realize that you, uh, you had a, a science background. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, when we spoke earlier, I, I mentioned that, uh, even I was a little bit confused as to the scope of your work at NYP. I mean, I have people in hospitals tell me all the time that they've forgotten more than they've ever learned because there's just so much to know. And they always have to keep learning. Patients have to be educated. There's a whole academic component. So, um, for the audience, can you help us understand the, the, you know, the scope of your your responsibilities at NYP? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, we are responsible for learning and development as it pertains to the employees in terms of new orientation, new manager orientation, leadership skills, um, any, any type of soft skill professional development that's done. Also, we do a, a lot, if not all, of the regulatory and compliance related training um, for the organization. Uh, other groups may be responsible for the content, but we're creating it and or delivering it. So, um, you know, anything that comes up, if there's a new initiative in the hospital, we'll do the training of leaders and staff on whatever the new process is or the new, uh, you know, um, new components of that. We also do a lot of the training on a lot of the clinical systems that our staff has to use, whether it's the system that delivers the medication or how to use um, different components that they use uh, you know, during, the, during their day-to-day -day jobs. Uh, we also do some of the electronic medical records training um, as it relates to some of the old legacy systems. So there's, there's always something coming out, whether it's, like I said, a new initiative, a new program, if there's a new skill we wanna develop, we're doing things like that. Okay, so it is very, very broad, um, but largely focused on developing this, what, some 20,000 person workforce that you have across yeah. how many hospitals? 
So we have um, 10 hospitals, we have four medical groups, we have a number of affiliate hospitals, and we also sit between the two Ivy League medical schools in New York, um, the Columbia School of Physicians and Surgeons, as well as the Wild Cornell Medical College. Um, in addition to learning, I also have responsibilities around talent management, which I share with someone that's on this call, my, my friend and my colleague, David Crawford, who's here today. So I'm so excited to see that he's here, um, as well as I'm the diversity executive for the hospital. So, so it's, I, I have a couple hats, but we all do, you know, everybody, that's, that's the way of the world now. So um, really excited and, and honored to be part of the New York Presbyterian family. Yeah, I, I can certainly relate to wearing multiple hats. Um, and I imagine that, uh, you know, over the last 18 months or so, uh, those responsibilities have changed quite a bit. Can you, can you share a little bit about that? Yes, it has, you know, we all, you know, we all say this, did we really live through this? Um, this was just such an unprecedented time. Um, as you can imagine for a hospital, it was even, even worse. And for New York Presbyterian, we were at the epicenter of the epicenter. Um, through the early days of this pandemic. And um, the, the 47,000 employees at New York Presbyterian are truly, truly healthcare heroes. They saved a city. Um, and you know, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't lost on all of us of, as to what they, they gave personally and professionally to do that. And we came out of wave one in late, late spring, early summer. And you know, it was an organization that had to heal itself because they had been through something so traumatic. And then in the fall, we went right into wave two. We started coming out of wave two um, in the spring and here we are, it's August and we're finding ourselves in a third surge. So this was a time where everybody had to band together. We had to all do whatever we had to do to help. Um, we had people redeploying uh, who were not clinical folks to help, whether it was run scrubs or meals or, or sadly, more duty. Um, so imagine being an accountant and somebody saying, tapping your shoulder, we need your help because we, we can't keep up with this and, and having to then redeploy uh, you know, into, into, into one of the areas of the hospital. And as a result of that, there was a lot of learning that had to happen and it had to happen quickly. And, you know, you can't, you know, you might have taken two weeks to develop something to write a storyboard and get everybody to agree on it. And then you do the design and then you're the testing and deliver it. That went out the window. Um, so, you know, there were some good things that came out of it, like very quick decision making and collaboration um, that, you know, everybody put everything aside and was like, join arms. We've got to do this and we've got to do this quickly. So, um, you know, it, it, we saw some really interesting things happening from, from a skill perspective, from a teaming perspective, from a leadership perspective. And, um, you know, like I said, everything went out the window, your, your development timelines and all of that, you were fighting against the clock. You were fighting against an unknown foe, if you will, and, and having to make sure that the people in the hospitals that were on the front line of this war, because it is a war, um, believe me, it, it's a war, had to have those that information about new CDC guidelines, new PPE requirements, whatever it was, they needed that information. That was our responsibility. We were also getting nurses and doctors flying in from all over the country from other health centers to help us because they, they weren't anywhere near a, the first wave yet. So when they came in, we had to orient them. Um, because, you know, we're in a, in a regula regulated or, you know, uh, uh, industry, and we had to make sure we were, you know, uh, you know, besides all the work David's team was doing in finding all these people to help us, we then had to train them, and we had to orient them to the hospital and, and the requirements and all of that, and we really had to, to move very, very quickly, um, and we also had to keep our, you know, keep staff safe to help to be redeployed. Um, and I, I saw the question about what we did to, to pivot. Luckily for us, we've always, as an organization, always think about contingency planning. So, you know, we always had in-person orientation, but we also had created an online orientation just in case of a contingency, whether there was a natural disaster or there was, you know, someone was sick or there was something that, you know, extenuating circumstance. So we had that online orientation already. So when they said, we've got to stop, we can't do this in person anymore, we were able to pivot like that because we had it already. And I think that's one thing that was so great for us was 
because as an organization, we, we, we try to think of every scenario and to be able to meet that situation, we were able to, you know, other people were scrambling to create online learning or uh, online orientation, and we were able to just move. Um, yeah, so, so I, I, I want to I focus on that for a second, because I've seen a lot of people do what a lot of people do in a crisis, which is hunker down, try and survive it and get through it. Just keep, you know, keep doing what they're doing. And now, kind of like you're saying, I mean, the third wave isn't hitting everywhere yet. And it feels like people really want to get back to the way things used to be done. But it sounds like the work that you all put in ahead of time to, to be ready for distance learning, to have fl flexible methods for delivering your training really paid off over the last 18 months. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and having an in-house e-learning team that... Um, I think is is the best in the business. I, I think they're they're just amazing. Uh, they worked round the clock and they were developing training in a matter of a few days instead of you know our normal process timelines. They were literally working round the clock, getting people to review things, test things, QA them, put them in sandboxes, make sure it was able to to be accessed by people coming in externally from an external facing LMS versus an internal. They thought of everything. And we were able to, as needs came up in the hospital, work very quickly and get things turned around. Um, and, you know, uh, also because we also have a group of, of instructor, you know, instructors that do instructor led training and instructional design, they could work very quickly to pivot everything they had. Uh, to, to change the design to, to fit virtually. So they were delivering things virtually over Zoom. Some things needed to go onto e-learning. Again, the e-learning team was just responding so quickly. Everybody just banded together. And it was it's an eight-person team, the e-learning team made up of whether it's graphic designers, instructional technologists, you name it, they all banded together. And we were turning things and cranking things out really quickly. And it, and it was engaging and it was, pleasing to the eye that's that was the incredible part it wasn't just slap something up and get it out there um, because that's not them they would never do something like that so it was something that was still engaging and 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 really you know keeping people's interest and people were learning through it so it was remarkable I think what they were able to do and it and it's because of how how you know their dedication how we're set up as a team and how the organization, um, everyone's so mission driven at the hospital and everybody knew this is our part. So we weren't taking care of patients, but this was what we needed to do. We needed to can do you, whatever we could. Can you share some specifics about how they had to change, how they had to adapt the content that they were making? Because we, we talk to folks a lot of times who think, well, we're just going to take our PowerPoints and throw them up on the web, or we're just going to you know, take all of our material for in-person training and, and, and hanging it on an LMS is going to make it remote. Right. Right. Um, right. But I mean, this is like the most extreme case of that. And it sounds like, you know, like you said, the accountant who's working the morgue, like these are whole new protocols. So how does the team adapt to that and, and, and manage great to crank question. out content on time? That's a great question. So all of our, like, for example, our classroom training was very, very interactive and, you know, we we make sure that we're throughout the program doing. You know, we use the the Kirkpatrick met level uh, levels of evaluation, and and we have a lot built into our training programs to show that there's a transfer of knowledge during that training program. So very interactive types of things where people are practicing, whether it's a skill or 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 a process flow or whatever the case may be. A lot of that doesn't translate well over. A Zoom. You can't just slap that up onto a PowerPoint or have the instructor, you know, kind of walk people through that. So we had to really take a step back and look at what is, you know, what's going to be the attention span of people. How much time are people going to be able to devote to to something? Because knowing that we couldn't keep people off or away from their jobs for for very long at all. So we had to maximize the learning time. So we had to look at How's the way we're gonna deliver that content going to change to get to the heart of the matter? How can we do that using breakout groups in Zoom to get them to talk about it? What may, you know, what do we have to put in in terms of post-training support, um, whether it's uh, you know, office hours virtually or whatever? We had to really change the design and change the design very quickly. Um, because as you said, you just can't take the classroom, say we had a two-day classroom on. Uh, you know, on a topic like having difficult conversations, 
you, you're not gonna have people on Zoom for two days in the middle of a crisis, especially sure. the hospital. So yeah, um, and they you, did an you mentioned job with that. You mentioned, uh, you know, post-training support, uh, which, I mean, even when it's not a crisis is a great way to make sure that people are retaining information. Um, but what what worked? What what do you think were the most effective tactics that you employed? Yeah, um, I think, you know, for us, there's a couple things. Um, there were a couple instances where we had um, apps created. Um, you know, we had done work with, with your organization and had put together apps, you know, to support, um, for example, our regulatory work, um, and, you know, for preparing for a joint commission survey. So a lot of that regulatory training that was changing because of the changing requirements, we were able to pivot that very quickly from an e-learning perspective and get that out, not only in the learning center, but also in this app so that people had that training with them when they needed it. Um, knowing what their days were like, we had to make sure that training could be accessible wherever the person was, um, wherever they were working. Um, it was making sure that everything we created was mobily enabled so that they could access it from their phones, whether it was on an app, whether they were accessing the, the learning center. We have a learning center which is um, supported by our learning management system that they could see it, support it, be able to see whether it was a video or a job aid or or an actual quick e-learning, whatever the case was, we had to make sure that everything was accessible on the fly, you know, able to, to, to be seen on the go. So that was part of all that, that testing and things that they were doing. It was, it was, it, it added another element of complexity to the work that um, they had to do, but it was so important because in the middle of a crisis, that learning has to be portable. That learning has to be at your hip, in your hand at the bedside if you need it to be. Um, so, or, you know, if they're they're commuting or whatever the case may be, they didn't have a lot of time to say, oh, I'm gonna devote an hour or two or three to, you know, sit at a computer, not gonna happen. Right, and, and I mean, good chance that now that folks have seen how we can uh, support their needs in, in terms of the time that they had to dedicate to this, I, they probably don't wanna go back to the old way, do they? No, you know, it, it's interesting. We were talking a lot about that. And, you know, with our orientation, um, the fact that we went virtual um, in the old way, you know, pre-pandemic uh, in the old world, um, it sounds so crazy saying that, but that's that's what we're li living through. We used to do it every Monday. There was an orientation. One Monday, it was at Columbia. The next Monday, it was at Cornell. Um, it was an all-day orientation, very interactive, very, you know, fun and engaging, engaging the new employees to the culture and to the leaders, et cetera. Obviously that, that changed and we went to online learning. So as David's team was bringing in, you know, they were working tirelessly to bring people in from all over, traveling nurses, traveling doctors, um, people that were willing to volunteer, whatever the case was, instead of having to wait for a Monday like you would have in the, in the, the previous um, situation, we're now getting it out to them. They're taking it you know, a couple hours that day. We could get them onto the units much quicker. So it was helping us mobilize that staff quicker instead of having to wait to when you, your start day was. As it was happening, we're orienting them and getting them off to the departments to have their department orientation and, and, and you know dive right in. So for us, that added an element of agility to get those people that we needed so badly onto the job. And that was, you know, training played a big piece in that with David's team. We worked very closely with our talent acquisition family members. And it was like one, two, here you go, here's the list, send them the training, get them what they need to get, get them on on, you know, pass them on to the, their department. And for us, that was that was uh, important as well. Same thing with people being redeployed. We had to we had to reorient people being redeployed. We had to make sure that we were training people that were, you know, typically at our corporate building, either doing IT or HR or finance or, or communications, whatever the case was. They're now going to be on a hospital unit, hearing alarms going off, hearing codes being called, seeing some really intense things happening. We had to orient people to that even. Um, to emotionally, mentally prepare yeah. them for what they were doing, and and I'm glad you went there because that was my that was my next question. I mean, the the logistics and a lot of the practical considerations are front and center for all of us. I mean, folks have been on lockdown; everyone's been living on Zoom, um, except for folks who work in a hospital and, and can't live on Zoom. They have to to be there in person. But 
for those of us at home, you know, we might read an article six months into this whole thing that says, if you're not feeling productive, it's okay. You're not the only one. And, and, you know, people were processing what this meant for us emotionally, what this meant for us psychologically. So what have you learned about the needs of your staff and your learners um, in, in that sense? How has that changed? Oh, you know, it, it's, it's the, the effects of this pandemic are going to be felt for a very long time. Um, our, our CHRO likes to talk about the tale of the pandemic or the next pandemic, which is the emotional piece that you're talking about. There are going to be emotional ramifications from this for so long, whether you work at a hospital or not. We've all been dealing with so much. Um, we know family members and friends that have been affected or lost to this horrible disease. In the hospital, we lost teammates to this disease, um, as well as everything we went through. So, um, you know, I think anything an organization can do to support the emotional well-being of its its people is 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 paramount to to it being successful. We're very lucky. We have an incredible well-being team that has put together just a whole host of of resources. But in training, we also had to, as a learning team, um, especially for the people that were doing virtual instructor-led training, they had to understand that they could ask a question about the content and people would answer it completely different and just want to be able to talk and have the space to talk about what they were going through or what they were feeling. So we had to really make sure that people understood that as well, that our trainers were creating an environment where people felt safe. And if they needed to say something, they were, you know, in a safe space, we could connect them to resources. Um, so we had to, you know, we had to understand that. Um, as an entire HR organization, we also looked at what else do we need to do? What types of focus groups do we need to do around to find out what worked, what didn't, what resources did they like, what ones did they need more of? So not learning specific, but another part of my team worked with our well-being team to do all of these, these focus groups just to give people that, that chance to talk. Um, we did poll surveys to find out what's working in terms of communication, what's working in terms of well-being support. Um, there was so much that was done to really make sure that employees knew that they were in an environment that, that cared about them. And we cared about the whole person, not just the professional working person of them. We cared about them, we cared about their families. Um, and even in a lot of the diversity and inclusion work that my team also does, we created safe spaces for people to talk, um, whether it was about what they were going through, um, or, you know, and on top of all this, um, in wave one of the pandemic, we had all the racial injustice that we were all witnessing and horrified by. So on top of all this, we were just constantly stacking this up on these poor people. Um, you know, it's like, how much more do they have to deal with? So yeah. we even did a lot of learning around understanding, you know, we, we did a session across the organization with our, our psychiatry partners, understanding the, the, you know, trying to break the stigma of trauma and, and post-traumatic stress and understanding what that looks like and what that feels like so that you could understand your own symptoms. Um, so yeah. let me ask, you know, as a, as a technology vendor myself, I'm super conscious of the, the conversation around what kind of impact technology has on people in this sense. And, you know, there's all kinds of studies that like social media, for example, tends to exacerbate depression or, or, you know, psychological maladies. Um, and I, I'm sure that people can feel the same way about distance learning. So is, did you notice any ways that technology was especially helpful or you know, perhaps harmful in trying to accommodate the, the emotional needs of folks in this difficult time? You know, I think, I, I think the technology is a double-edged sword. You know, we're all li living on Zoom. Um, in a way, it's great to connect us and we can visually see one another and you can see someone's expressions or emotions or at least just feel like you're connecting with them. But it's also a double-edged sword because you are dealing with so much emotionally that you didn't want to be on camera all the time, you know, and it was you know, people were like, why isn't so-and-so on camera? Or we need to have everybody on camera. And we had to really take a step back because after a period of time, people were fatigued. Um, they were fatigued of talking to a screen day in and day out. Um, you know, there's, there's different styles of learning that we have to deal with. Some people are introverted, some people are extroverted. 
some people don't want to let everybody into their personal space. Um, you know, we had some learners saying, no, I'm not going to go on camera because I don't want everybody looking into my house or seeing my sacred space. I need to have that, that homework separation. Um, so it was really a double-edged sword. It, it helped us, but it also was difficult for a lot of people. Um, you know, and now it's, it's to the point where we're saying, hey, if we can do something as a phone call as an organization, let's do it as a phone call because people are just tapped out, you know, 15 months into this constantly, you know, being on Zoom. So we had to marry what was appropriate, what wasn't. Do we need to do everything as training per se? Can it be done in different ways? Can it be done in a job, like a very visual job aid? Can we um, do things as train the trainers and, and have people going out within the units and talking about things in huddles? Um, so we we didn't just look at the traditional methods of e-learning or classroom or, or just a, a job aid. We wanted to see how else can we get out there and get people talking, um, whether it was creating discussion guides for leaders to have conversations to continue the learning at the, you know, at the bedside in the unit. We, we looked at a lot of things, a lot of ways to do that, to continue, like I said, continue this conversation in a different way and keep it fresh in people's minds and get, get people to change behaviors. Cause that's why we do the learning, right? We wanna teach new skills, change behaviors. So we were looking at a lot of ways to do that differently and continue that within the department setting at a team huddle around a vision board or a goal board um, in a timeout situation um, in the middle of a procedure. We were looking for different ways to, like I said, continue that learning out. How do we use learning circles? How do we create online communities? Again, to continue and be there supporting one another in that learning journey. Yeah, so I, I think you're kind of hinting at it now, but I'm, I'm you know, you were obviously very prepared going into this. Um, you were able to use a lot of the, the processes and tools that NYP was already using to, to get through this. But were there any new skills that your learning team or that you had to pick up in the course of this to feel like you were being effective? Um, so many. You know, our trainers, um, we had uh, within our training teams, they were, um, you know, uh, observing one another, giving each other tips because some people are more um, comfortable in training over a computer than others. Some people are very animated in the classroom and just have this great rapport and are able to draw people in in the classroom. And we had to make sure that that was translating and they were able to connect with people online as well. So they were supporting one another. They were tag teaming with one another if they if they wanted someone there to, to, to give them feedback. Um, our director was was you know jumping on giving people feedback. They were sharing skill building amongst themselves. So you have to kind of amp it up a little bit um, when you're used to being in front of people live and you can interact with people and, and feel that energy. You have to ramp up differently to do that over, over virtual. Um, I think another skill we, we all acquired, whether it was the learning team or, or, or everybody else in the hospital was quick decision-making. What worked before didn't work now. So why is it working so quickly now? Like it allowed us to take a step back and say, you know what, some of our processes were creating too much bureaucracy, you know, bureaucracy and we needed to kind of take that out. And we learned from that as an organization as well. Um, I know my team did. Um, I saw my e-learning teams and training team, um, you know, one team sits under one director, one team sat under another director. I saw them coming together very differently and helping each other out. So the people that were doing the clinical systems training were reaching out to their, their virtual instructor-led training partner saying, what do you think I should do with this? And what ideas do you have? I want a fresh pair of eyes. So it, it caused us to collaborate, I think, without, without lines of distinction, if you will. Um, it, you just saw people coming together to really really help one another. Um, I think it also helped a lot of my team members were redeployed onto our hotline. So they were talking to employees that were scared that were testing positive themselves for COVID um, or that were having a hardship in their family and you know we're, we're pursuing our hardship fund. And it created a level of compassion that was just amped up, I think, in the training staff to really be able to better relate what they're doing to what people are facing. That now that, you know, we've come out of wave one and wave two and gearing up for wave three, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, 
in their classrooms, their virtual classrooms, they have a deeper understanding and appreciation for, for the constraints that people are under because they were delivering them scrubs or meals and they're witnessing the, the, the sheer audacity of what, you know, just a, a glimmer of what these folks were, were facing. So I think it makes us more compassionate. It makes us more in tune with our learners. Um, I think that's a positive skill that's, that's come out of this um, oh, besides well, all of the, the technical. No, no kidding. I mean, uh, we, we constantly encourage folks to do more listening, you know, instructional designers, a lot of the times are used to being very didactic and, um, you know, pushing the content out. Uh, and, and I know that that's a common complaint from clinicians uh, about hospital administration. Um, but I mean, working the, the hotline and, and talking to folks who are, who are asking for help, that's a whole new level of, you know, empathizing with your, your learner population. Yeah, I, I've just seen a whole different side to how they approach training as a result of, of, of this. For example, one of my trainers who is, we, we always tease and call him the mayor because he is just the most engaging, um, just ball of light um, in a classroom. And he connects so incredibly well to, to his learners. And you know, he was doing a great job of doing that virtually as well. He volunteered on more duty. It changed him. It changed him in such a profound way that I had him speaking to our entire team and he spoke about what that experience was like and it humbled all of us. And, it, you know, he, he got us to talk about how do we need to understand our learners differently and what do we need to do? And I think that's a wonderful thing that came out of this. Um, you know, and now it's like when we go to design something, it's like, no, you know, we can't look at the purity of the, you know, we're, we're always as designers, right? We want to talk about the purity of the content and the learning methodology and all of that. We get very kind of, you know, uh, as my director of t &D says, we become our learning geek selves and we love that. Academic, it's causing yeah. Us, yeah, it's causing us to take a step back now and say, stop, what is that learner's day look like? Um, in this new environment and what do we have to do differently and how can we enhance that and, and engage them still knowing what is swirling around them. So it's, it's caused us to look at design very differently. I, I can completely relate. Um, some, of, some of our folks who spend a lot of time talking to customers have helped me cut out words like pedagogy that doesn't necessarily <laughs> you know, relate to the, the, the work that folks right. feel like they have to, you know, they have at hand with our product. Um, so kind of along these lines, you'd mentioned something that I thought was really interesting about the, op how your operation changed. You spent a lot of time and energy on recognition and, um, you know, again, we, we try and encourage people to listen and to make sure that there's a two-way conversation going, but beyond just hearing, uh, em employees and hearing the audience, can you talk about what effort you put into recognition and how that changed the work you do? So recognition is something that's that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I think it's so important. I think it's it's a forgotten element to um, to a lot of what we do to engage employees. Um, you know, I, I refer back to uh, there's a book called um, uh, Great Work by Dave Sturt um, from OC Tanner, and um, we use the OC Tanner platform, and they've done some incredible research around what are the things that drive great work. And there's three things, there's three components. First, people wanna make sure that they have a, a mission that they can um, you know, align to and feel um, part Engaged, of. Engaged, yeah. We got, that, we got that at NYP because you don't come to healthcare without being so mission driven for the, the, you know, the, the human condition. The second thing is they wanna be able to do their best work and know that they're having an impact. Again, here we are, uh, especially in a pandemic, right? Um, third thing is they want to know that somebody sees them and appreciates and recognizes them for their contribution. So you have three those three things, you're going to get that great work. Um, we also look at it from an engagement standpoint. Gallup tells us that you have to do engagement every seven days for an employee to feel continually engaged, that you know what they're doing and you react to it and you respond to it and you acknowledge it. In a crisis, Gallup said that that goes down to seven hours. You have to do recognition every seven hours. That's crazy when you're fighting, um, you know, this this global pandemic. So what you know what we have done was we created some really engaging. Um, our e-learning team, our graphic designers, created some really 
um, engaging um, visual uh, e-cards that were kind of to the heart of the matter, like celebrating frontline heroes, that we were all in this together to save New York, that there was strength and unity, that we were all going to get through this together. Very inspirational, very visual, very um, um, emotional, if you will, graphical designs that we put onto our our, e our recognition platform, but it didn't stop there. We started doing recognition challenges. So we were having, you know, um, a virtual high fives. So we created this virtual high five program that just randomly sent out a recognition to someone. And it was a just a virtual high five. I see you, I see what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing. And then you had to send it on to someone else. And it was a way to start getting recognition to spread in a great way. And I know it sounds something so simple, like an e-card and you think, yeah, what's that gonna do? I mean, kind of like the 2020 version of chain mail. Exactly. I remember I sent one, um, I, I would sit down at night and before I go to bed, I would sit there with my, my, my app, my recognition app and just start sending them out and just trying to think of inspirational things to say to people and to just let them know, I care, I'm here, you're amazing, you are a hero. I sent one um, on, a, on a Friday to our chief nursing executive. And I, you know, I just said to her, I know this, you know, how hard this is on you and your team. You are heroes, you know, we are behind you. We, we think you're amazing. And she called me right away and she was choked up. And she said, how did you know I needed this tonight? Wow. I needed to hear this. She said, you will never know how much that meant to me. And I was so taken aback. And I'm like, it was just a little thing that I could do. And it just showed the power of that. And, you know, we started doing other things um, within HR. Even we had this moments of inspiration where every Monday to start the week and every Friday to end the week, one of the executives was sending out something, you know, we did this for several months, just whether it was a song, a video, um, uh, you know, their thoughts, um, a, a graphical image just to, to tell everybody, I know how tough this is. We have to be there for our teams in the hospital. And it was just, it kept people going. Um, and it was just those little things. We did a lot on social media. Our social media team was amazing. Um, we had things that were on social media, just celebrating you know, our heroes. The community was amazing. We had community children drawing chalk pictures and making drawings and taping them outside the building so that as people were coming into work, they were seeing this. I mean, it's those little things that were just like, wow, okay, the city is behind us. Um, but we, we wanted to make sure that we were constantly driving recognition and kind of, you know, making sure that leaders weren't losing sight of that. Yeah. Um, you know, so that, that, uh, that story about the, the chief nursing executive, I mean, I think that drives home the the value of, of those kind of efforts, but at the risk of sounding a bit cynical, did you worry at all about things like alarm fatigue or people feeling like it was, um, you know, impersonal or, or insincere? Um, you know, we didn't just because um, what they were battling, you had numbers rising so ridiculously. We were putting up field hospitals in within a couple days. Um, there was so much happening. Um, you know, it was, you had to do whatever you could to let them know that they mattered, that there was a moment for them to smile. Um, our well-being team set up recharge rooms throughout the hospitals just to be able to go and sit somewhere and take their mask off alone in a room with like aromatherapy, like, you know, being piped in and, and kind of spa music just to breathe. We would put, we would get cards from all over. Our vendors were sending us drawings and cards and just putting them around wherever we could. It meant so much. It was that little push to keep people going. It, it wasn't, you know, people constantly kept saying, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It means so much that you see how much we're doing. Um, even when we were providing meals round the clock for people, they were putting little, little, you know, kind of little messages in with the meals of, you can do this, you're a hero. It's those little things that when you're that fatigued, that just means so much. It means that somebody knows, um, not just keep going, keep going, keep going, but you're a hero, we're behind you, we think you're amazing. It meant a lot. Like we had nurses saying, thank you. Just thanks for, thanks for acknowledging this. Thanks for making sure we had food. Thanks for making sure that somebody was running the scrubs to us, that we didn't have to leave the unit. Um, 
it, it wasn't, it, you know, and there was, um, you know, the clapping for people. Some people are like, yeah, I don't have time to go outside and hear people clapping at seven o'clock every night. Others were like, this is amazing. Like this was just the recharge that I needed. So we had to do things in, in different ways to, to engage what's going to work with different people, right? Because nobody's, nobody's, you know, the same way we have everybody's sure. going to react to different things so it was a matter of how creative can we be what can we do differently to keep people going um even in the guides we created in learning to give to people coming in from other hospitals we put different things in there for people um my team worked with the well-being team to put together a staycation guide for people so that when they were home there were things they could do with their kids whether it was a free museum virtual tour or a virtual um, Broadway production that was being done virtually that you could sit there with your kids and do, um, you know, different games to do around the house, icebreakers, fun things to do. When I feel like I could use one yeah. of those guides. Yeah, I, I think we're, I'm hoping we don't have to use it again, but, you know, it's, it, we had to think of whatever we could do to support that individual, not just as a, as a nurse or a doctor or a transporter or a, you know, a therapist, but them as a person, as an employee who was worried going home to their families and worried about their kids being home, having to be homeschooled and, and homeschooled and they're, and they're in the hospital. We had to do, we had to look and surround that whole employee with support. And I'm, I'm just so proud of the HR team with the work that they all banded together. It didn't matter whether you were in talent acquisition or talent development or total rewards or HR operations or site HR. Everybody was just banding together, what can we do to help? What do you need? Yeah, and and so, I mean, I know that this is a smaller portion of your population, but it sounds like we're, we're talking a lot about how we can support this, the, the majority of folks that are, that are at NYP just doing what needs to get done. But what, is, what has changed about how you do leadership development in the face of this crisis? That's a great question. Um, you know, we looked at how we are developing leaders um, and took the time um, in between wave one and wave two to refresh our leadership training because um, what we saw was people needed authentic leadership in a way that they never thought they needed it before. We needed leaders that led with compassion, that led with authenticity, that listened very differently, that um, you know, we're engaging their staff differently. Um, so we had to look at not only the, the, the nuts and bolts of how you, you know, what, what a leader needs to do and what they're responsible for and the, and the, you know, the competencies that we identified in our competency framework as leaders needed, but how do we, how do we, you know, t you know, kind of frame it so that we can also have them learning how to be an inspirational leader and how to inspire differently. So there's a program we created on becoming an inspirational leader. Um, how do you coach differently um, in this setting, knowing that there's such heightened emotions and fatigue and things like that? So we had to really look at our content and, um, and, and change some of that up. A lot of it was, you know, leaders had to re-engage their teams very differently. They had to refocus their teams differently. They had to help them go back to find their why. What was their why? What was their purpose? What was the reason I joined healthcare in the first place? So we had to get leaders thinking differently about- It sounds like some doing. pretty difficult stuff to teach. Yeah, you know, we're still there. We're, we're still inputting it. It's not like, it was like, oh, we just designed it. We're done. No, um, this is- this is an evolving process that we've been working on, but that's where, you know, we've been piloting some things with some groups that, that were, were struggling. Um, and that's what it really came down to. How do I refocus my team? How do I re-engage my team? We also created learning supports for leaders in between wave one and wave two. Like when we're coming out of wave two, how do you get people to get back to doing some of the day-to-day -day that was coming back online after what they've been through? So. You know, we had to have um, supports for leaders um, from a change perspective, from an inspirational perspective, from, a, you know, an HR perspective. Um, so we spent a lot of time working on that and creating these, these post-COVID, if you will. And I, I, I say that with a chuckle because I don't know that we'll ever be post-COVID at this point, but 
kind of coming out of wave one as we were renewing a lot of the the day-to-day -day work and, and different work was coming back online, you have to refocus your team and, and right. well, each and leaders. So likewise for your team, I'm sure that there, there might be some things that you feel like have fallen out of focus that are, are there, is there anything that you're worried um, that we need to get back to or, or, or is it, uh, you need, um, you know, you've I, lost I, focus I on? do worry. Um, that's a great question, Colin. I do worry about the fact that, you know, we've, created things so quickly and our timelines were, you know, we had people working around the clock and were able to put something together that was engaging in like 24, 48 hours. And people are like, oh my God, this is amazing. Thank you. And people were just cranking. I get worried that people are like, well, you could, you did it before, so you can continue to do that. That's, that's not sustainable um, um, when you have a small team. Um, so I do worry about that that um, you know the timelines are getting shorter and tighter and smaller. Um, so that that is my concern um, that you know some of those expectations are not sustainable. And so I mean are you is is the expectation, well, are you planning to say manage manage up or you know manage that expectation for your team? Are you hiring to to meet the new expectations? How do you how do you navigate that? Um, yeah, we're not we're not hiring, um, as you can imagine. Um, you know, where it's our focus needs to be on staffing at the bedside and staffing um, in the clinical areas. But we're managing that as leaders, so um, that's part of the negotiation. With here's what we can do if we need to do that. Here's what has to come off our plate. So that's that's something myself and my directors um, and my peer vice presidents are, you know, having to kind of reset some of those um, some of those expectations across the organization. So looking forward, like you said, we, we may never be post COVID, right? Um, hopefully at the very least we can get to a point where um, the strain on the folks that you serve is, is reduced and we're able to, to manage these, these waves as they happen. Um, but what do you think is the most important thing for learning teams um, in hospitals or, or otherwise um, to, to continue to succeed and, and to grow as high functioning learning and development prof professionals? That's a, that's a great question, Colin. I think there's a couple of things. Um, I think we always have to stay close to our learners and understand what our learners are facing, what they're up against, not just assume that we know we need to be out there. We need to shadow them more. We need to talk to them more and we need to listen to them more. And I think this showed us that we needed a deeper connection to our learning, our learner bases and what their challenges are on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's one thing for them to tell it, but it's another thing when you see it and experience it for yourself. So I think that showed us that we have to have just that much closer connectivity um, when we're working with a group um, to really understand what it means for them. Um, I also think that, and this is something I've always said with my learning teams, whether it was J&J &J or Avon and, or you know, now at NYP, we always have to keep one eye 10 to 15 years out. So we have to always look at what are the technologies? What are the different ways people are doing things? What's coming down the pike? And we have to be able, we have to know what that landscape looks like because it's our responsibility to bring those types of things into the organization. How can we make our learning more effective and more efficient? Because as, as the world gets more and more complex, it, you know, there's not a lot of time, there's not a lot of people to do the work, and there's not a lot of money to do the work either. So we constantly have to be innovating our approach um, to keep up with the challenging environments that regardless of what the industry is, we're all, we're all up against that. So I think that's something that I'm constantly telling the teams, we have to constantly keep one eye into the future because you have to see what's coming. You have to see how you can use that because you never know when you're gonna be called upon to have to bring that in and it's gonna solve a problem that, that you're facing as an organization. So I think it becomes even more critical now that we're constantly looking at the future and, and create processes that allow us to be as agile as possible. I hate to say that word. I know that's a new corporate buzzword, but we have to be. We have to be as agile as possible in our processes to be able to pivot at whatever's coming at us. And, and the last 15 months have shown us that. 
Yeah, well, I, I really appreciate you sharing that uh, last little bit of wisdom with our viewers. And I'm sure that the, the folks at NYP feel really lucky to have you leading uh, the, the learning programs at, uh, at the, the organization. One. I'm the lucky one. It is truly an honor to be part of this organization and to be to even be associated with these heroes. Um, they're incredible. It's obviously taken a lot out of everyone over uh, the last 18 months or so. And, um, you know, on, on behalf of everyone watching, uh, you know, thank you for the work that you're doing, supporting those fo folks on the front line, because, um, you know, at some point, any one of us may be depending on you to uh, to make sure that, you know, we can get back to, to doing our job. So um, really appreciate well, everything together. that you shared with us today. <laughs> We are all in this together, but thank you. It's been it's been a it's been an honor to be here and speaking with all of you. And I just my wish for everybody is um, great learning, um, and please all be safe. Um, and I wish safety for everyone's families as well. All right. Well, thank you very much, Andrea, and thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, I'll hand it out, over to Adam to take us out. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Uh, this was training the modern workforce live, presented by Ology. If you'd like to explore previous episodes, subscribe to our Ology YouTube channel or like us on LinkedIn and Facebook. And if you'd like to connect with one of our learning specialists to see how Ology can help improve your training, head to ology.com and schedule a demo or drop a note. All right, see you next time.